Hey guys, my name is Javier Perez and I'm currently a senior material artist at PlayStation's Visual Arts Service Group. I've been in the industry for about nine years now. In this lesson, we'll be going over how to create a muddy dirt road in Substance Designer. We will be covering techniques, thought processes, and general understanding of how this material was made. So let's get started. So to begin, I'm just going to start up a brand new graph and name it accordingly, just Dirt Road Recording. I start off by dropping in a PBR material node and then create the outputs from said node. This will give me the correct outputs that I'll need so I can get the 3D viewport um, connected to these outputs. So here I'm just creating some preliminary values. I just connect um, basic colors, grayscale, and then the correct um, nodes to the corresponding outputs. So for example, the normal has a normal node, ambient occlusion has an ambient occlusion node. And it's all connected to this single one uniform color. I make sure my material is set correctly, make sure tessellation is on, and direct X is off as we are working in OpenGL. So to begin the material, I'm actually going to start off with the initial dirt mounds on this guy. And to begin, I basically just throw in a clouds too, and then I do a transform uh, to scale it up slightly so we can get some larger shapes rather than the minuscule ones from the original clouds too. Uh, when I do tile it though upwards, um, we get some seams. So that's me bringing in the uh, make tile photo. And I just mess with some settings to break that up a bit. I'm then going to warp that output within itself and a blur. So I just take that um, output, I blur it, and then I just connect it into the gradient input of the warp. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do another warp, but this time a directional uh, with a different clouds and a different blur. This way it gives us some nice streaking in the dirt. And then I bring in a histogram range to just level out the, um, the height map. So in case we start bringing in more things into the height map, which we are, it doesn't, um, you know, get out of uh, the range of the values. So next up, uh, let's actually get the road indentations in there. So to start, I'm just going to do, um, a shape and I'm just going to tile it twice to get so we get two rectangular shapes here. I'm going to mess with the edges of that guy by uh, slope blurring it with the clouds. And I'm just going to do a slight blur so we could get rid of some of the stepping that's going on from the slope blur. I'm going to then bring in a histogram so we could clamp those values so we just get the black and whites. Then I'm going to add a non-uniform blur to get some nice subtle gradients going in there. Next up, I want to blur some kind of noise over that indentation. So I'm just taking a Perlin noise, directional warping it, and then blending onto the original shape of the uh, dirt, uh, the tracks. Uh, next up, I'm going to do a directional warp on that guy. And we're going to actually take a directional noise, uh, setting it to some values that I found that I liked, uh, doing a non-uniform, and then blurring it just to get something a little bit more subtle, not harsh. And that's what we connect our directional warp in there. So now we're starting to get some nice undulation on the indentations there. I'm going to take another directional warp and this time just use a regular Perlin noise to, again, just get some more striation and then some more directionality to these guys. Lastly, I'm going to do a, a final blur high, scale, high quality grayscale and then just blurring that on top of the original dirt mounts that we have. So now you can kind of see we have these indentations. So it looks like there's been some kind of driving over or something like that. Next up, I'm going to take a uniform color and I'm just going to plug that into a height blend with our original output. And this is going to level out the blacks a little bit. So you'll notice how they went from these dark, darker values to just some somewhere in the middle with the grays. Um, I'm going to do some directional mud here. So I'm just going to do a Perlin noise, going to level it out to get some of those blacks coming through. Going to do a directional blur, then a directional warp. Then I'm going to do a slope blur grayscale, get these nice chunky shapes in here. And then we're going to do a blur high quality grayscale to just subtly um, get rid of the harshness of that guy. We're then going to take that uh, result and they're just going to blend it on top of our mounts. So here I'm just making sure I'm naming everything. I'm continuing through the graph. Um, we're going to add some more streaks here. Uh, I'm just going to take a crystal two, do a non-uniform, and then just rotate it 90 degrees so it keeps the same direction as what we currently have in um, our 3D viewport. So now we're getting some nice streaks going on and just continuing to name everything. 
Next up, uh, this is where we start adding our actual overlays here. So something's kind of subtle. So I'm just taking a moisture noise, but I don't want it to affect the entire um, output there. So what I'm doing is I'm taking our last result and I'm just doing a histogram select and then blending that with the clouds. And that's going to give us a nice mass that we could plug into our opacity um, into that blend. Next up, uh, this is where we're actually going to add some cracks on this guy. So to do the cracks, I'm doing a tile generator. And what I'm trying to get here is just some subtle speckles. Some, so I'm doing like some disc shapes and we're getting like just very light speckles here. So really small spheres and what that's going to be plugged into is a distance and a histogram scan. So when you plug those two guys in, we can actually start getting some kind of like what you would get in the cell shapes, but this gives me a little bit more control of what I'm doing. We're then going to warp that result to just break up the edges a little bit. And then we're going to do another uh, warp to break that up even more. So this time with a moisture noise to get some finer details in there. Cool. Once we have that, we're just going to do an edge detect so we could get the edges and only focus on those. And from there, we're going to do a flood fill and then the flood fill to gradient to give us all these different gradients at different angles. Next, I'm just going to plug that into a blend. I'm going to plug it into the background and opacity. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a moisture noise blended with the crystals. And this is going to give us some nice... Um, It'll, it'll overlay overlay uh, on top of the original uh, gradients. And once we have that, um, when we add a histogram scan, as we're doing here, it'll actually give us some more cracks that we'll be able to overlay um, as we continue through the graph. So here I'm actually just messing with the crystals to see where, where we can actually start um, kind of bringing in those different gradients that you see here. Messing with them, some valleys, making sure everything is looking good. Again, I'm doing another edge detect. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that result and plug it in with the first edge detect that we had earlier. So you can see now that we actually have like two sets of cracks. We have some smaller cracks, the larger cracks. And what we're doing here is we're actually just bringing in another flood fill, doing another flood fill to gradient, and then blending those two together. We're going to then do a slow blur grayscale within a Perlin noise just to break up the edges slightly. And then we're going to do a histogram scan to just bring the blacks and whites. We're going to do another histogram scan with a flood fill. And what this flood fill is going to do is we're going to actually plug in two flood filter gradients. This way we're going to get, we're going to basically do the same thing that we did earlier where we blended the, this result onto the output that we have with the histogram scan. And this is just going to give us some more variety in um, the shapes and the gradients. Once we have that, we're going to break up those edges a little bit with a slope blur grayscale. And lastly, just do a non-uniform blur grayscale to break up those edges even more so. What we're going to do with that guy is now that we have these cracks, we want to blend it into our current output. So, but before that, I don't want these cracks to overlay on top of the whole thing. So what you see me doing here is just creating a subtle mask. It's just inverting the output that we have, doing a histogram scan and just blending it um, in itself. And that's gonna be plugged into the opacity. I plug it in here and I notice that I'm actually on the wrong blend mode. So make sure to put an add sub and just lower the opacity slightly. Here, I'm just kind of rotating the 3D viewport, making sure everything is looking good. I do actually go back to the beginning of the graph and just uh, tweak something slightly to get the result I'm looking for here. Next up, like before, we're just going to add some more surface noise. I'm just taking a dirt, high passing it grayscale, and then just blending that on top of our current result. This gives us a little kind of finer detail that you can kind of see here. And making sure I'm naming everything accordingly. Moving the outputs out of the way because uh, this next part's going to be kind of big. So we're actually going to start on the tire track. So before we were doing the indentations, this is the actual um, shape of the track. So it actually looks like some tires have gone through this dirt mound. And what I'm doing here is I'm just taking some shapes, transforming them into um, 
what can look like tire tracks pretty much. Um, I took a tile generator, did a safe transform, so we could get those diagonal striations, and I'm just blending those um, within itself. So then we start getting those kind of directionality on the tire tracks. I'm doing that a second time on the inner piece of the tire track. So we have these kind of larger rectangles on the edges, but we're also getting this skinnier um, rectangle on the inner, as you can see here. So this is looking a little um, too perfect, uh, the current result. Um, I'm actually just tweaking some values here to, to get it to my liking. So now that we have that, um, I'm just going to do a non-uniform uh, blur grayscale with a purlin noise. And this is just going to break those edges up a little bit because they were looking too perfect. So we want these tire tracks to look a little bit worn. And what I'm doing here is I'm just doing a grunge uh, overlay. So I'm doing, uh, you can pick any grunge you want, doing a non-uniform blur and then blending that on top of the tire tracks to break it up even more. I'm going to plug this result into a tile generator, which will tile the actual um, tracks a little bit. Um, we I just get around like six of them. And then I'm plugging that into a transform because I want to be able to move it into place when I actually blend it onto our current dirt mount. But before we do that, we are actually going to break that up even more so with some of the mass that we're getting from the height map as it stands right now. So again, I'm just doing an invert grayscale histogramming select, and then I'm doing a multiply here. So now you can kind of see that we're introducing some of those mounds and it's breaking up the tire tracks. So when we actually blend it onto the initial or the material as we have it now, it's not, those tracks aren't going to be perfect. They're, they're going to have some spotty like splotches. So um, just like you would see in the real world. So here I'm actually plugging this guy into the blend. And then I just use a plasma to break up the blending a little bit. So now you can kind of see that we have some really nice breakup, but there's still the, t the tracks are still there. So we just wanted a nice representation, but we didn't want them to be perfect and uniform. Some subtle storytelling. I go into the outputs and mess with the ambient occlusion slightly just so we can kind of get a better view of this guy in the 3D viewport. Again, I'm just moving stuff out of the way. And this is where we're actually going to start adding in our grass on this guy. So here I'm actually um, just creating the single strand of grass that will be tiling all over this material. It, it's just a shape, transforming it, um, squashing it down, trapezoid, um, adding a gradient, and just adding a stem in here with another shape, blending it onto itself. So we get that nice stem in the center. And here I'm just going to do a directional warp because I don't want this strand to be just perfect up and down. I'm doing a purlin noise with the directional warp. And this is just going to give us some nice, just breaking up the shape a little bit. So it's basically not just straight up and down. I do this three times to get um, just different variations of the same uh, strand of grass. So, um, And I make sure to move the directional warp settings a little bit. So each time we get something different. So sometimes it could be leaned to the left, the right, could be more curly, etc. Now with these uh, strands of grass, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to plug these guys into a shape splatter. What the shape splatter does is similar to tile sampler, it tiles the object that you plug in um, however you want. But with the shape splatter, it conforms to the height map that you have plugged in. So I plugged in the our current result that we have right now into the background and um and then here you see me create a mass because i don't want the grass showing up everywhere on the um on the material so i'm just messing with the the histogram scan here because i only want the grass to show up more so on the edges and not where the tire tracks would be because realistically like where it uh a car would go over or a truck or whatever, um, the grass would probably be dead in those areas. So that's mostly where the mud is and stuff like that. So here I'm just creating a mask that is actually plugged into the mask random of the shape splatter. And that basically tells it um, where you want this grass to show up more in places than others. 
Here I'm just going through the settings of the shape splatter. You can either, you know, follow along and uh, use the same values that I am, or feel free to just kind of play around and see what results you get. The the numbers that I'm plugging in here, um, I found that worked pretty well for the result I was looking for. And it's just kind of overlaying the grass on certain areas and making sure it's conforming to said, um, to said dirt. And here is where we're actually using that mass random map multiplier. So that's taking into account that mass we just created. And once we have that, I'm just gonna move the out, the connection points and see how it's looking. Making sure we can start seeing the grass start up populating in there a little bit. It's kind of hard to tell with the gray scale or the gray value on the 3D viewport, but later on, um, once we start adding the color, it's, it's gonna look a lot better. Next up, um, kind of moving on here, um, just general, generally, um, we're going to be basically doing the same thing. We're just taking these new shapes and creating new kind of details that will be splattering across the material. Similar to how you saw the grass variations, we're basically doing the same thing, but here I'm actually just creating a clover shape. So I'm taking, um, just an oval shape, doing a trapezoid, a pinch at the bottom, and just adding some gradients, and then doing the stem with, uh, similar to how we did on the grass with the shape, um, warping that slightly with a purlin noise and then blending it onto that original shape. Again, adding gradients so the height map reads it correctly when we actually add it on this guy. Here you see me just blending this guy in, so it kind of, tapers off at the bottom and here I'm just rotating it slightly and then I'm going to do a mirror grayscale here so we get almost that heart shape and that's similar to the shapes that you would see on clover leaves um, and then once we have that shape looking pretty good we're going to plug that into a sh uh, splatter circular and what this does is it it basically tiles the shape that you plugged in in a circular fashion so here you see me uh, messing with the different uh, components, different settings, parameters to get um, a result I'm looking for. So I was basically looking for something that looks like a four leaf clover or in this case, a three leaf clover. And so we have that, we just wanna start breaking those edges up similar to how we did on the grass. We just wanna do some warps to get those edges kind of just warping a little bit. So they're not perfectly straight and brand new. Once we have that, I'm just gonna do a levels on all these guys because I. I had a feeling that the these darker ranges that these clovers were weren't going to necessarily work the best on how for how the height map is currently set up. Once we have that, this is where we're actually plugging into the shape splatter. Again, similar to how we did with the um, the grass, we are just plugging in those results and then we're taking a mask similar to how we did on the grass and it's it's basically the same mask that we use on the grass. It's plugged into the same area where it's the um, mass random. And this is essentially going to tell it where to put those clovers. Um, again, I didn't want the clovers to be where the, the um, dirt and indent indentations and the tire tracks would be. I just wanted them to kind of sit on the higher peaks of the material. So around the edges of where those tracks are. Again, making, moving the connections, making sure everything is looking good. I noticed that I missed um, some parameter changes here. So once I ask, or once I move the mask random map multiplier up a little bit, you'll notice that the clovers kind of um, started uh, moving away because before they were just covering the entire thing. But because we want the mass that we created to influence what's going on, that's uh, one of the parts that we were missing there. So moving along, um, I'm on this part. Um, it's basically, if you saw the original cliff video earlier on in the series, um, we're doing the same thing where we're, we're creating a clump of grass in this case that we're going to tile the same way with the shape splatter. But before I add it to the shape splatter, instead of having a single strand, like we did with the original grass earlier on, we're doing a, a smaller clump here. 
And what we're doing here is uh, we plugged in a few different inputs. So we did a shape, um, we did uh, invert grayscale, normal, we're plugging those into the inputs of the tile sampler. And this is just gonna influence some of the parameters that I'm uh, messing with here. And what I'm looking for is a nice circular clump of grass that will be able to tile all around our material with the shape splatter. Once I have one that I, once I have one that is looking good, I duplicate it two more times and then I just go into each tile sampler and then uh, mess with the value slightly so we can get different clumps every time. So again, just, um, just messing with the values just slightly to get somewhat different results because I don't want all the clumps of grass to look necessarily the same. But um, this is gonna be even more so when we actually plug into the, um, the shape splatter because there's some settings in the shape splatter that we can kind of mess uh, with the size random, the scale random. So if we just do these ever so slightly, the shape splatter will help us even more so. So here, just making sure each clump is looking different. And again, I'm just plugging in values that I felt worked for me. I'm just referencing a graph um, off screen. So feel free to play with uh, whatever you guys want. Make something cool. So here, this is where I'm actually plugging in these, um, these grass patches into our um, current material. So again, just plugging the, those guys in there and then making sure the current material is set to the background, which is that top input connection on the shape splatter. And again, I'm looking for another mass that'll help me to kind of tell the shape splatter where you want these grass patches to be. Again, it's just a matter of using inverts or histogram selects. It's basically a black and white mask. So um, here I'm actually just messing with the, um, the parameters again, trying to get a result I like. It's easier to see in the 2D viewport than it is on the 3D again because of the grayscale value that we have going on here. So if you guys are having trouble, um, I would recommend early on, uh, I would kind of block in just preliminary colors. It don't have to be anything crazy. Um, so if you wanna have like darker values or just preliminary colors, feel free to do that if you guys are having trouble to see what's going on in the actual material. I double click on the normal to kind of see what's going on, making sure everything is reading accordingly. And here I just do a quick save. Don't want to lose any of my work. Again, making sure everything is looking good in the 3D viewport. And we're just going to keep uh, continuing on here. So the next thing that I'm going to tile is uh, we're basically doing the same pine needles that we did on the cliff. So one thing we can do here is we can either create this from scratch as you see me doing here, or we can just go back into our cliff material that we did um, in the last video. And we're just, we can just copy that graph if we'd like, um, whatever suits you guys uh, best. I, I wanted to show you guys how I did it again. So again, it's just um, basically using a gradient, transforming it 90 degrees. And then we're utilizing the curve node um, to kind of tell the silhouette how it's going to look. Uh, we're, we then take a histogram scan to get a nice black and white um, shape. And then that's when we begin kind of warping in, adding our overlays here. Once we have those, this is where we're actually just rotating these pieces because I want them to feel like those kind of two strands that you would find fallen from um, just any sort of tree or those pine needles. I use a height uh, blend to blend those two together. And then because they're still sort of um, kind of perfect and straight, I then do a directional warp, but this time instead of using a Perlin noise, I just use a, um, a paraboloid shape and then move it with a transform into place. This gives us kind of a nice um, opportunity to control where the curve is happening. Whereas in a Perlin noise, it's just kind of random and sporadic. So again, um, this is kind of, this is going to be kind of the, um, big topic in the video is we're using the same, the same, uh, shape splatter. Um, so the same method that we're adding the cloves, the grass, the, uh, the grass patches is the same way. We're just continuing to lay 
on this material, similar to how you would in Photoshop, just overlaying things. The shape splatter is a good one because if you notice in the 3D view viewport, it's kind of conforming to the shape of the mounds. It's just not like straight up and down. It's actually, if the mound is kind of curved, the shape is kind of curving with it. So it's, it's following that shape. So now that we have these guys, we have the grass, we have the clovers, lots of organic stuff. Um, we're actually gonna start adding some stones in here. Um, so to create those stones, I'm just doing some cube 3Ds and I'm just inputting some values that I thought worked for me. I did three variations because we're gonna plug this guy into a tile sampler and we're gonna change the tile sampler to just uh, two amount, so two by two. What this will do is it'll just give me a quick way to um, do any sort of edits if we need to down the line. So once we have that, we're actually going to overlay some more stuff onto this guy. So I'm just doing a, I believe it's a paraboloid and just blending on top of each other. And here's where we'll really start seeing the actual rock shapes coming through. So we do a clamp and an auto levels and you can kind of see those shapes coming through. Next up, we're doing a gradient transform and then the levels. And this is almost in a way to me, it's like we're, we're kind of chipping away. It's like a nice slash. Think of it as like a trim dynamic in ZBrush where we're doing like a big planar shape and we're blending that on top of our current rocks. And what this is doing is just kind of cutting away at some of the shapes. Next up, um, I'm gonna do a histogram scan and doing a bevel on that. Just so you'll notice here that we get a nice subtle edge um, right where the rock meets the kind of the edge of the, of the shape. And then I'm gonna do a flood fill, do a random uh, gradient, and then just overlay that on, on top of the current rocks. What this will do will give us some nice shapes, how kind of like what we did with the, the uh, dirt cracks gives us a nice angular variation. And here I thought these rocks were looking a little too pristine. So again, just doing a warp and choosing any sort of noise that I, I'm liking. So a clouds. And um, here I'm actually going to add some undulation onto this guy. So each kind of plane on the rock right now is pretty, pretty flat. Um, we just want to break that up a little bit. So again, I just took some cells, slope blurring them with a the clouds, warping that slightly and then er inverting that result. And then here you can actually see me doing an add here and that kind of breaks up the surface of the rocks a little bit. I make sure to go back to that original histogram and uh, plug that into the opacity. So it, that, um, that kind of crack shapes that we have overlaid, it only affects the rocks. So now that we have these four rocks, we want to crop these out to be just single rock shapes because we want to, um, as you see me doing here, we just want to shape them a little bit differently. We have a little bit more control on what we can do here. Instead of doing overlays and whatnot on all four of them at the same time here, it just gives me a little bit more control so we can clearly shape it here and do whatever we want with these guys. And again, I'm just going to take another shape splatter and we're going to plug this guy, these guys into um, these rocks into that shape splatter. And this is, going to do the, exactly the same thing as the grass and everything else is that it's going to overlay on top of our material. Um, on this guy, uh, I wanted the, again, I'm doing the mass that we've been doing earlier where we, we want the, we want the thing that we're overlaying to be in specific areas. So that's why I only want the rocks to again, lay on top of just the higher valleys of this material and not where the tire tracks would be. So here I'm just messing with the parameters, finding something that I like. I found that, you know, it looked really cool when we had a lot of rocks, but it just wasn't working for what we wanted to achieve with this material. So when we start getting to the mask random kind of parameters, it's, you'll notice that a lot of the rocks are getting kind of um, masked out. Um, you know, a couple here and there work pretty fine for um, the material and what I was trying to achieve. We're going to keep doing the same thing, but we're going to do medium and smaller rocks. And I think that balances out having way too many larger rocks. Um, we can kind of uh, fill in those gaps with some medium stones and some smaller stones. 
So instead of creating brand new stones, what we can do here is we're basically just taking the exact same results that we created with the stones and just plugging it into a new shape splatter. And what I'm doing here is this mask is essentially going to tell that shape splatter, I want these medium sized stones to appear around the exterior of the bigger stones. So you, you'll kind of get this nice, um, you'll have a, like a large stone in the middle and surrounded by these medium sized stones. So it's a nice way to kind of show your large, medium and smaller details. But again, uh, I'm just going through the parameters and this is essentially just gonna um, shape splatter these rocks over the entire material. But because we have that mask, we're able to control how much of them are showing up. So you can kind of see in the 2D viewport as I'm messing with these parameters, it's pretty sporadic. There's a lot of them going on, but once we start masking them out, you we only get like one or two, and that's pretty much all we need for this material. So next up, we're gonna just do the final uh, set of stones. And these are just the um, just the really fine detail ones. So it, I think it gives uh, the material a nice breakup on the surface. And instead of, um, for this guy, instead of just masking it to certain areas, we're actually just gonna have it go all over the place. Cause with these smaller ones, I, I felt that not only can they be on the higher peaks, but they, I feel like they would show up like, you know, where the tire tracks would be and whatnot. So here I'm just creating the mask and plugging that guy in there, making sure everything is looking good. Again, throughout this whole just graph creation, I'm making sure to frame everything and naming it accordingly because this is gonna help tremendously finding things when we actually create our albedo color and our roughness because we're just gonna grab the same connections. And if everything is just spaghetti and we're just plugging randomly, we're it's gonna be really difficult to find those connectors um, down the line. So again, making sure everything is looking good just messing with uh, how much of those rocks are appearing. And that's kind of our last connection here. And that pretty much covers it for the whole um, height uh, for this material. Um, next up, we're actually gonna dive into the, um, the albedo here. So to get that process started, I'm just gonna take uh, the final output of the height and we're plugging it into an ambient occlusion and then blending that um, on top of itself. This is just going to give us some nice detail that the gradient maps um, are going to be able to read. So this fractal sum is actually blending even more noise. The more noise I found um, that we have in our uh, output that we plug into our gradient map, the more kind of colors and sampling that the gradient map will have to choose from. So it gives us a better result here. Um, these colors you see me grabbing, I'm just sampling off screen from my final material. And then um, I'm just using different HSLs and levels to get um, just different color variations. Just like we did on the cliff video, I'm using the get slope node that can be downloaded from the substance share website. And this is just gonna give us a nice mass that we can start blending these two different HSLs, these levels to kind of break up the surface a little bit within the color. So you can kind of see here now we have like some darker browns, some lighter browns, and it's just giving us a nice variation within the dirt. So here I'm just plugging it in to kind of get a sense of what's going on. And we're just gonna continue on this trend of plugging in these um, HSLs and um, grabbing different connectors from early on in the graph. So here I just went ahead early from like way in the beginning of the graph. Um, it's a mass that it broke up. It, it basically is where the indentation happens. So we have this darker value on the um, lower level of the material and then this lighter value on the top um, level of the material. I felt like it really helps kind of accentuate what is happening with the height map as you know i feel like darker values work better for recessed valleys and lighter colors um, help for like peaks so again um, just going through and grabbing mass tire tracks and then here is um, here's where we're actually grabbing the the uh, mass for the grass and what i did here was i actually used a shape splatter blend and what this um 
what this does is that you can actually input the the outputs of the shape splatter into this connector and it'll give you some nice mass that we can play with so here we're able to get the gradient map for the grass and then we're we can easily plug that into into um, what we currently have for the albedo again i'm going back just using a flood field or random grayscale making sure it's just black and white and that's how we're able to tell this blend only have this color show up on this area so it's basically masking it out again this is kind of how i was describing early on where we're basically going back into our height map and finding these connection points where we're blending um, these different things together and we're just creating these black and white masks to kind of tell the blend um, okay this is where i want this certain color here um, i basically just did a hsl and then use that same mask um, but this gives me a subtle variation within the grass so we went from this green to now you can kind of see we have this yellowish uh, strands in there as well doing the same kind of thing that we did with the grass i use that shape splatter blend and i'm inputting those um those outputs from the shape splatter into the splatter data and then plugging in the original shapes so this is this essentially is giving us a gradient of our clover shapes and this is gonna again be the same thing where we're gonna keep doing the same thing as we continue on through the albedo so I'm going to be doing it on the grass or sorry, the clovers, the grass patches um, and the rocks as well, the pine needles. So basically we're just kind of re rinse and repeating, just doing the same thing over and over. You feel free to kind of copy the same HSL and the same gradients over. It'll, it'll buy you some time and also it'll get you the same colors more or less in the same range. So that helps you out in the end because no, no uh, color will kind of look different. You'll kind of be sampling from the same values. So it kind of helps when you're um, creating your albedo here. So again, just what I've been talking about earlier, going back, making sure getting a black and white mass and then using that to blend in these new colors and tell, it's essentially telling it like, okay, this is where I want this color to show up and so forth. So now we got those grass patches coming through and I wanted to do some more grass variation. So again, I'm just going back, seeing where I can get another mask. And here I'm just doing, uh, changing the position and range on the histogram select. So we're essentially using the same mask, but um, because we're changing the position and range, it's giving us different strands that it's choosing, which is really nice. So that's a quick and easy way to get some variation in there. Here I'm just sampling off screen, um, choosing the colors I like. Feel free to, what I like to do is when I'm originally creating the color, um, I grab something from like CG textures or any Google reference and I just, that's where I'm grabbing all the, um, the color swatches in the gradient node. So here I'm doing the pine needles and again, kind of how I, talked about a little bit um, just reusing the colors that you already have inside of your albedo so what you saw me doing there with the pine needles I basically went early on we had like this nice brown color for the dirt variation I just went ahead and grabbed it and just plugged it into an HSL um, move the sliders slightly so we could get like either a darker or lighter range in there and uh, basically just use that to color in the um, the pine needles so here this is where I'm doing uh, basically the same process but I changed the gradient map here to kind of be something a little bit a little bit more rocky and more um, just darker so it's not all in the same shades of brown so we can kind of see that differentiation um, in the uh, the mud and the rocks here so I want it to be subtle, but also like you can definitely tell like, hey, there's there's some rocks here. And here I realized that something was looking really off in the 3D viewport and that it was that I did not turn off direct X in the uh, material. So if you're getting some weird artifacting or something just isn't look right, make sure you're on the correct um, normal mode. So 
the normal map was getting authored in OpenGL and my um, material was set to DirectX. So just make sure you're in the, sorry, correct rendering mode. So here I'm just going through again, doing the medium rocks this time, constantly looking in, in the 3D viewport and just rotating, making sure everything is looking good. Again, just grabbing the mass that I'll need for the small rocks. This is going to be one of the kind of last um, color additions that I add to this guy as far as like grabbing stuff from the height map. So here um, again, just grab the uh, medium rock gradient map because I like the colors that it was choosing there. So making some adjustments and then just blending it um, into the necessary uh, locations, plugging in the correct map masks. That way it's only showing up where I needed to cool so that pretty much covers the the blocking of the colors for all the different um, details that we added in here these kind of next thing is I'm doing just a dirt overlay and this is kind of um, it's one of the final things I like to do on my material it kind of grounds it um, adds like some nice almost like variation into the dirt so you saw me pick just a uniform color there and the dirt node is a really nice way to get some variation and noise into your material. Um, and lastly, I'm going to take my normal map and create two different curvature cavity maps, if you will. And I'm using curvature smooth and curvature, uh, I believe it's Sobble. And I'm just going to blend those on top of my color map. It really, I feel like it really brings out the shapes and it really brings out like the edge highlights of a lot of the uh, details that I have going on in the um, color map. So again, just making sure everything is looking good, making sure to frame everything. And here's, I'm kind of just moving some stuff around because I know I'm going to need some space for the roughness map. And for the roughness map, I basically take the final output that I had in the albedo and I just run it through a grayscale conversion to get a really quick, um, just really preliminary grayscale value. I then take your levels and then kind of push that a little bit further just to get it in the correct values that I'm looking for. And this is where I'm actually just bringing in the, um, my own values. So like I, I brought in that uniform grayscale color and again, kind of similar to what we did with the albedo, we're basically just grabbing the mass from the different details. So I started out with the get slope that we did in, in like the beginning of the albedo. And here I'm just gonna start bringing in the different details. So it's very streamlined in the way you work in left to right. You're basically just trying to find the same inputs. And it's even easier now because all these inputs are in your albedo. You know, we're just kind of duplicating those connection points and moving them to their respective like, um, roughness value here so again making sure all these values are okay and you know messing with the uniform colors so for the roughness i like to stick to like you know just the gray scales keeping the whites or the blacks and then letting the blends uh or the blending mode do most of the heavy work so on the roughness you'll notice the grass patches are a lot rougher than um just some of the mud and the dirt Gives us that nice uh, variation when the light hits it once we uh, put this guy in the Unreal or something. So here just continu continuing on and I think this is where I'm actually adding the rocks on this guy. So this is uh, one of the final tweaks or sorry one of the final roughnesses. So um, with the rocks, you you see me doing like a darker valley here. So I wanted the, the rocks to be a little bit shinier, almost have that wet feel. And I just thought it looked cool when like the light hit the, the nice shimmering rocks there. So continuing on, always looking in the 3D viewport, making sure everything is reading accordingly. Cool. So one of the final tweaks on this material, we could leave it as is right now, but one of the cool things with substance is that it includes its own water level node, which makes it super easy to get that water effect. Like it's rising or lowering. 
So all you have to do is plug in your final outputs into this water level node and the um, outputs of the water level node, you plug into the final outputs of the material. So you can kind of see now we have like these puddles, which is looking interesting, almost looks like a river. But once we start messing with the parameters, we can really see the power of it. We can kind of get it a little bit more subtle and a little bit more realistic to what we're looking for. So I just wanted to have some subtle puddles. Um, I found them to be kind of low based on the reference that I was looking at for just this material. So push it up a little bit. So feel free to play around with however you want. And that pretty much covers this uh, dirt road material. Um, pretty much streamlined. We kind of did the same processes over and over again. It's just kind of creating your different details that you want to add and just using that shape splatter node. It's a super powerful node and I highly recommend you guys kind of take a look at it. Um, I hope you guys learned something and next thing is we're gonna take this guy into Unreal and create a nice road blueprint. See you guys in the next one. Peace.